Hi everyone, so my name is Mateusz Reznutasic and what we'll be doing today is we'll be discussing John Stuart Mill's political and moral philosophy, in particular the Harm Principle and its relations with freedom of speech, so one of the contemporary topics that you know we hear a lot about. So we'll be reading and thinking about Mill's philosophy and how it applies to debates about freedom of speech. So what we'll be doing today is a part of a debate and philosophy typology project that we are doing among other among other organizations designed with Protein. Um, so you know the point of the project is to show how debate can be useful for teaching of philosophy and how philosophy can be useful for doing debate. And, you know, obviously, today we will be doing more of a lecture style thing, when we will be talking about the principles of philosophy and how they apply to contemporary debates. And then tomorrow, there comes the more interactive part of, you know, uh, you guys brainstorming on different motions and doing the debate as well. So let's begin. So firstly, who was John Stuart Mill? He was a 19th century British philosopher, arguably one of the most famous British philosopher, actually. Um, and, you know, he was born into a philosophical family. So his father, James Mill, was a famous utilitarian philosopher in Britain as well. And thus, you know, he took a care for John Stuart Mill's education, which was very rigorous, included learning lots of different languages, starting with different subjects very early and so on, which led to severe depression for John Stuart at the age of 20, when he had a breakdown. And, you know, it's after this age of 20 that we see a different uh, John Stuart Mill emerging, a more independent one, one moving away, away from the classical utilitarianism towards a rule utilitarianism as well later on in life. So about John Stuart Mill's life, I think another aspect of his life is important to be highlighted. So his political life was also very active. So he worked for East India Company, which was a colonial enterprise in Britain uh, between 1823 and 1858. And during that time, as you can see, he also picked up some ideas about the British colonial project, which influenced his philosophy as well, as we will see in a second. When it comes to politics, he also participated in the Liberal Party. He was a member of its more radical wing and even a member of parliament between 1865 and 68. Um, he was also considered a proto-feminist, a proto-defender you know, defender of female emancipation. So one of his famous essays is The Subjection of Women, which was published in 1869, that deals with these topics. Um, and then his political philosophy. On his political philosophy, there, are, you know, there is one big work that we'll be discussing today. It's on liberty, published in 1859, but also other works such as socialism, his essay about socialism and liberalism, published in 1879. So without any further ado, we want to discuss a bit what the Harm Principle is. So what is Mill's you know, basic political philosophy? How do we come then to the problem of freedom of speech? How does it interact with the larger philosophy um, that Mill proposes? So the Harm Principle is, as Mill says, the sole end for which mankind are warranted individually or collectively in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. That the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. So what Mill says here is a number of things, actually. So firstly, and I think quite clearly, he says that we can only interfere with another person's liberty when we have a situation that there is harm being done to someone else. What this entails, though, is a distinction between self-regarding and other regarding actions. So for Mill, we have actions that only regard ourselves. So for example, you know, in some instances, our actions don't interact with anyone else. If I drink a glass of wine, you know, at the end of the day, this doesn't harm anyone, Mill says, which is why the state should not interfere, for example, in abolitional activity. So they shouldn't, you know, um, say that we shouldn't drink alcohol at all. On the other hand, we have other regarding actions. So the actions that do not only concern ourselves, only our being, but also other people. So for example, you know, drinking on the job, um, even though it's not that different than drinking alone in the evening at home, is harmful for me. Why? Because when you drink at the job and get drunk and you know you cannot do your job properly, that's you're harming other people. So, you know, I think this distinction is quite important for me. So actions that actually need to be considered and subjected to public will are actions that are other regarding. Because for Mill, the main philosophical question that he entertains in you know, liberty is the question of whether of when society can legitimately interfere with the individual. 
So, you know, for him, self-regarding actions are not the grounds in which you can legitimately interfere. The action needs to be other regarded. But then secondly, what Miller here distinguishes is between social, natural, and, you know, legal punishments. So for him, you know, some actions such as, you know, binge drinking, drinking too much, being a drunk, um, might not be harmful to others. But this does not mean that, you know, people don't instinctively react negatively towards them. And for Mill, that's okay, as long as this does not include stigma, or as long as this does not include, you know, legal punishments. So he's saying that lazy people and so on will receive natural punishment. So punishments that are inevitably because of their behavior, which is, you know, in a sense, us feeling pity, us feeling, you know, that we need to help this person, but it does not entail us and it does not give us the right to exercise social punishments, such as stigma, and it does not entail us the right if you would legally punish those individuals, so for example, by banning alcohol consumption. So all of those things, um, you know, are important to distinguish here. And again, I want to stress that for me, it's important that only other regarding actions even begin to enter the sphere of discussion or whether society can legitimately interfere. Whenever there is no other regarding action, there is no discussion about that. A societal intervention is illegitimate for him. Okay. So additionally, the harm principle is not a sufficient condition for me to intervene with liberty. So what he's saying is that, you know, obviously it's a necessary condition. There must be an other regarding action that causes harm to someone else, but also it's important to say it's not sufficient. So because he's a rule utilitarian, which means that he believes that we need to examine utility on whether something as a rule is more beneficial or more harmful. Um, you know, this is why he doesn't want to say that any single time there is some harm caused by an other regarding action, we need to limit it because there might be other benefits that outweigh it that are more important. This is why the harm principle, even though it's a necessary condition for a legitimate societal intervention, it's not a sufficient condition for legitimate societal exercise of power. So this is why, you know, and this is something that's important to note. So for me, it's always necessary to also consider whether the action as a rule brings more utility or less. <coughs> Sorry about that. So secondly, what he does is he makes some exceptions. He says that the harm principle does not apply to two different groups. Firstly, to underage persons and mentally ill. So people who do not have a sufficient mental capacity for me to you know, actually exercise their liberty. In addition to those two groups, um, Mill also says that it does not apply to uncivilized communities, right? So if you look at the back previous slide, um, you know, this is only when it comes to exercising power over any member of a civilized community. This does not apply then to uncivilized communities um, that Mill talks about. For example, he does not think that, you know, the Indian people have the same rights as the British people. So he believes that, you know, there governments can interfere even when, you know, there is no harm to other people. So, you know, this is what I was aiming at earlier when I said that the, his involvement in the colonial project can be seen in his philosophy as well. He obviously does not set up his philosophy as a critique of the British imperialism. Rather, he continues to endorse it throughout. But, you know, why is it so important for me? Um, why, why is it important that we do not limit liberty in the first place? Why does, you know, why do we, according to Mill, need to have so much liberty? And actually, for me, it's pretty simple. Humans are progressive beings for him, meaning that we can evolve, we can discover new things, we can find out about new ideas, and, you know, we need to test them out. So for him, we cannot just take up what exists around us. We need to experience it for ourselves. We need to think about it for ourselves. We need to discuss it for ourselves. And only through this experiments of living, as he calls it, we are able to actually, you know, live up to our potential as progressive beings. So we need to test out different things. We need to do different things. We need to talk and think about different things in order to avoid ape-like imitation. Because if we are only imitating other people, like, you know, um, apes do, in that case, we are not humans. We are not acting as progressive beings. We are just following someone else blindly. And this for me is just not okay. So what he wants is to, for people to have maximum liberty um, that you know is compatible with equal liberty for others in order for them to actually live up to their potential as progressive beings in order to use their reason, in order to discover different things, to test out different potential ways of living.
uh, test out different experiments of learning. I think that additional step that's important to consider here. So, you know, now we have cleared up what you know, means with the principle, to whom the principle applies, and, you know, what are the basic premises and things we need to be careful about. But I think that on the other hand, there is another thing where we need to think about, right? So it's about harm. So, you know, how to define harm in this case? And this is a contested concept, right? So, you know, a lot of philosophers have written about this. A lot of philosophers have thought about this. And, you know, there is, you know, not really a consensus. I mean, some debates are still going on. So I think that what we will do is, for today's purposes is think about harm as injury. So Riley sets it up as a first instance perceptible damage. So he says that whenever we have, you know, a first instance consequence that causes perceptible damage to someone else, then we are talking about harm. And it is in those cases that societal and legal punishments can be, you know, put upon an individual and its liberty restricted. So, you know, in cases when we have other regarding first instance perceptible damage, that's when we can legitimately interfere with another person's liberty. So, you know, this might sound clear, it might not, I'm not sure how you think about this, but I think there are three cases that you want to consider here, which show you know, how this is ultimately still a question and how some cases are open-ended and just depend on the interpretation of million principles. So for example, theft is a very clear example of first instance perceptible damage, right? So if you steal some, some money from someone else, this is obviously a first instant harm. So it means your direct action caused the harm to someone else. There is no intermediate there. You took someone else's money, someone else has less money. This is a direct harm. Secondly, there is perceptible damage, right? So, you know, it's very obviously there is a damage. We can see that someone is worse off if they have a certain amount of money less than they had before. So, you know, theft is a very clear uh, case of when someone's liberty can be restricted. So we can restrict people's liberty in order to limit theft or in order to prevent theft or in order to punish them for the theft, right? So all of those cases, this is how actually we are using the harm principle um, in practice. Second example is price gouging, right? So what's price gouging? Is that when you have um, a limited amount of certain resource, and then you know you are the one who has a monopoly or you're the one who has access to it in a certain area, and you're driving up the price, right, into obscene numbers. So for example, you know, during hurricanes in America, when you have people selling bottled water for obscene amounts of money going into tens or even hundreds of dollars just because they can't, right? Because you cannot get water elsewhere. And, you know, um, the, the those who sell water just want to make as much money off it as possible. And here we already see that the picture is a bit murkier, right? Why? Because is there a first instance perceptible damage being done to the consumers? It's not so clear, at least if we are using a more strict interpretation of meal, right? Because it might be a first instant action. So you rose your margin, you wanted to make more money. So you, rose the, so you increase the price of water. But on the other hand, is there a perceptible damage or is this just a consequence of market forces? Um, you know, so I think that here probably we are erring towards the side that there is a harm and that there is first instance perceptible damage, right? Because people are obviously way worse if they cannot buy water in this case. And this is caused directly by, you know, those who sell water, increasing the prices. However, you know, it's also not totally implausible to think about it in a different direction. But someone say that, that this is a consequence of market forces in this particular situation, in this particular scenario. This is a legitimate increase and it's no perceptible damage being done to other person because it's just market. Um, or even, Furthermore, you know, even if we show that there is some harm there, which we probably can plausibly, as we discussed right now, is it that overall utility of breaking the market principle in this case is actually as beneficial as we think? Or maybe, you know, there is more harm being done if we interfere with the market forces than if we take the harm that comes from price gouging. So, you know, those are the questions that we need to entertain whenever we want to apply million uh, harm principle in practice. And then lastly, the question of being, getting rich of interest on loans, right? So, you know, someone gives you a loan, um, gives you, I don't know, 10% uh, interest, and, you know, they get rich off of that. You have to pay this loan for quite a while. It's quite a high interest and so on. But for me, this is not a problem because there is no first instance perceptible damage, right? Someone loaned you money, so they helped you. They gave you some money that you didn't have at the moment, but you needed. 
and they're getting interest because they took a risk with you because they gave you the money that they did, were not sure whether you'll be able to pay back. And this is why, you know, there we cannot really talk about harm, right? So, you know, you help someone at least to a degree or at least you allow them to fulfill certain needs they had at the moment. And, you know, you also got rich on that. And, you know, people might frown on that, Mill says, but you cannot stigmatize someone because of that or you cannot punish someone because of that because you didn't do any harm to another person. There was no first instance perceptible damage, right? So I think those three cases illustrate what is the potential gray area of Mill's harm principle and what are different things we need to consider when applying it. So, you know, I think there are two main things to remember. So firstly, we need to show that there is harm being done to another person. So first instance, perceptible damage being done to another person. Otherwise, we should not even think about interfering with someone's liberty. But then secondly, what's important is that, you know, we need to remember that Mill was a rural utilitarian. So we also need to consider whether, you know, interfering with this liberty, even after we show some harm, might cause more harm than the action itself. So always revert to the rural utilitarianism and think about the problem of whether utility actually is fulfilled.